Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you because you are such a good God that you never withhold the great things from us, Lord. And even this morning is evident of that, Lord. We came into your house, Lord. We partook of your body, your blood, Lord. And Lord, whenever we come into this house, we know that you receive us open arms. So Lord, I ask that you allow us to open up our arms too, to receive everything that you've written for us, Lord, Every, everything that you've planned for us, that you've promised us, Lord, that we fully take advantage of that, Lord, because so many times we are holding on to our own ways. And Lord, our ways always fail. So Lord, I ask that we just learn how to surrender, Lord, how to be in your presence, how to take your correction, how to take your just your instruction, Lord, and, and how to follow the path that you have set for us, Lord. I ask, Lord, that in every single one of our lives here, Lord, that you show up continually as a big God that does big things, Lord, to a people who are willing. So, Lord, I ask that you be big, and I ask that we be willing. I ask that you rest with our heart today, Lord, that you give us all specific messages about what you want to see change in our life, Lord, that this night not just be a message that's delivered today, Lord, but it's something that, that is re reincarnate in our lives every single day, Lord when we decide whether or not we're going to get into your presence. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our many sins, Lord, that you strengthen us, that you hear these prayers lived in sessions, through the sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, St. Mary, all the saints and martyrs, as we pray one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for as a kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> All right, guys. Well, if you guys, um, if you guys uh, remember... <clears throat> This is going to be my last week for a while, so um, I will tell you that that is good for you guys because you guys will be blessed with what I believe it's going to be Mark Gerges for the at least next week, if not the next couple weeks. Um, I will be blessed because by the grace of God, I am asking for all of your prayers because I am having the opportunity to take my 12-year-old to Kenya with me. So um, if you could pray for us, that would be great. Um, it's if you guys so I am going uh, if you guys know Megan Gindi he's taking his kids if you guys know Noel Millick he's taking his kids if you guys remember Henny Dimitri he used to be uh, praying with us he's taking his son and um, we're going to go serve with Mbabulis in Kenya uh, for a little over two weeks so if you guys could pray for us while we're gone that will be we would really really appreciate that and I promise that I will pray for all of you as well um, so that being, we finished our parables talk, and then last week I decided I want to talk about something different. So we talked about last week um, a little bit about um, managing my life as deemed fit. We, we um, or maybe that was two weeks ago, we, we talked a little bit about um, when God approached Abraham and basically said, hey, you know, give me your tomorrows. We, we talked about a couple things, and, and my thing is what was the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about before I left, um, and it's something that's, it's, it's really, really close to my heart, and I figured... This was if I, because I'm sitting thinking if I only got one week, you know, like this is my last week with you guys before my trip, um, what would I want to talk about? And then I started thinking about if I only had one lesson to give for like the rest of my life, if I, if I could talk about the same thing every week for the rest of my life, what would it be? And it's the most important thing that I believe that we can talk about and that we could apply to our life. Um, it, was, it was a lesson that was so important that St. Peter wrote about it when he started talking about that he knew like he was close to his departure, right? Same thing. He knew that he was on a, limit a limited time. So he's like, what's, what's really, really important? And personally for me, this was a lesson that I learned when I was in college. Um, it's the lesson that I believe if I never learned it back then, I would never be standing in front of you guys today. Chances are I probably wouldn't even be standing up in the church today. It is that important. And it, really what it all comes down to, it's spending time alone in the presence of God with his Bible. I think that is the most important thing that we can do outside of the walls of this church. See, because once you can figure that out, everything else will fall into place. But you have to figure that out, right? Because once I was able to kind of figure that out, God would speak to me. He would give me tasks. He would give me assignments. He would, he would you know, move my heart towards something, and then I would do it. And that is how the relationship grew. It is the only way that the relationship grew. See, because at that point, you know, I love the church. 
I love everything in the church. I love the, the, the sermons. I love the, the Eucharist. I love the sacraments. But that is all the stuff that happens in the walls of the church. And I'm sure that we can all acknowledge the fact that that is great on Sundays. But what about the other days, right? And once I was able to learn that, then it, it, it changed everything because I wasn't dependent on waiting for someone else to read the Bible to me. I wasn't waiting for someone else to give me a sermon to understand what the Word of God said. Like something shifted at that point, right? Because I wouldn't have to wait for other people's messages. I wouldn't wait for other people to guide me. I wouldn't have to wait for other people to correct me. All of that stuff still happened, you know, on Sundays, in confession, with my confession father, on Orthodox sermons, no shortage of things, okay? All of that stuff happened. But when I was able to receive it in, my, in the Word of God, in my quiet times with God, God would tell me what to do and I would do it and that changed everything. See, and I question how many of us are actually reading the Bibles for ourselves. You know, I will tell you, I know a lot of people that they love the Bible, but they love it when Abuna Dawood you know, we'll give the sermon and then we'll listen to it on YouTube or, or other people who will have their favorite speakers and they listen to them on Orthodox sermons. And, you know, there's so many different avenues now where we can get sermons and we love listening to them all. And that's great. I don't want to discount that. But my question is, is do you read the Bible? Right? Like, can you do it on your own? Like, because I don't see how we can live faithful Christian lives without being in the Word of God ourselves. Everything else is a supplement. But we need to be in the Word of God ourselves. Because you see, the Christian walk, it's hard. And anyone who tells you it's not hard, they are lying to you. Okay? Because it's a challenge. And, and not only is it hard, but it takes a lot of correction. And, and usually, we don't take correction well from others. It's very easy for me to be listening to a sermon and somebody addressed something, and it might hit home with me, and I, I can either, sometimes I'll just brush it aside, and I'll wait for the speaker's next point, right? So make sure it doesn't marinate with me. There's other times where there's a, there's a great point, and I hold on to that point, and I say, this is great for so-and-so. I need to make sure that I tell so-and-so that Abuna had this great point, right? Because it's easy when someone else is, you know, just to kind of brush it aside, right? Or, or sometimes it's very, we're selective, about what we want to listen to, about what we want to study. Um, and we will choose things that are not going to hit the sensitive aspects of our life. Okay? And then, uh, you know, but I'll tell you something. When you are alone in the presence of God, with your Bible open, you can't lie. Because when I'm in the presence of God with my Bible and He is pointing at a very sensitive issue of my life, I can't deceive myself into thinking this is for somebody else. I can't deceive myself with something that, that this is not a big deal. Because I will be in the Word of God and God himself will be telling me, Peter, this is a big deal. This is what I want to talk to you about. This is what I need you to fix. Right? And I will tell you, I can deceive almost anybody into thinking that I'm a great spiritual guy. Right? I think we, there's even a term for you know, the orthodox humility. Right? Whenever you tell somebody something and you get the... No, 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 not me. No, 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 pray for me. No, no, no. We do, we do that very, very well. Okay? And we can, we can deceive people into thinking we read a lot. We can deceive people into thinking we pray a lot. We can deceive people into thinking that, you know, God has all of our heart. And we've gotten very, very good at appearing the way that we want to appear so that other people can view us. But I will tell you that the, if the inside, the inside life doesn't match the outside life, then all we are is really good actors. And I know I've said that before, but I am telling you, it is one of the things I am most passionate about. If your inside prayer life doesn't match your outside life or the appearance of your life, then all you are is you're a really good actor. Now, when you're sitting in the presence of God, you can't lie. There's no lies there. Because he points out things to you. And when he points them out to you, you know it's the truth. He knows it's the truth, and you can't deceive. He knows everything about you. He knows your thoughts. He knows our intentions. He knows the depths of our heart, the ugliness that's in there. And he still loves us. 
but he loves us through that stuff, to correct that stuff, to get us on the other side of that stuff. And it's so funny because I feel like, you know, who, who are we trying to deceive? Okay? Even at times in our prayers, we try to sound more spiritual than we really are in our prayers. And God's looking down at us. He says, I know that's not you. I know who you are. And I'd rather you to speak honestly and freely to me. Don't try to impress me. I will tell you the, the confessions of a speaker, right? There are times where I'll go and I'll give a talk somewhere. Um, and people will come up to me and say, hey, man, that was a great, great, that was a great talk. Other times people will say, hey, you know, that, what you said there, you know, that really touched me. One of my personal favorites, and it's the only time I've ever heard it, but then that's why it's going to be memorable, because I didn't understand what it meant until it needed to be translated to me, was uh, I gave a talk to somebody and somebody came up to me and they said, you really scratched my heart. That's an Arabic translation. Like, <laughs> but he was looking at me, he told me, you really scratched my heart. First thing I did, I apologized. I didn't know. I said, I didn't mean to. Like, if I hurt you, like, I'm sorry. Um, but sometimes, confessions of a speaker, sometimes I, I start to believe that stuff. Right? Like, I start, I start to believe. Um, but then the first thing I need to do when it comes to something like that is I spend a time alone in the presence of God. Right? Because presence alone, I mean, uh, time alone in the presence of God always keeps you grounded. Because when you're with the Almighty, right, when you're, when you're with Him and you see what He does and how He loves and how He pursues and, and all of these things, there's a quick, quick reminder that there's nothing good in me. And even the things that are good inside of me, He put them there for His glory, but it's really, really not me at all. See, because when you don't spend time in the presence of God, we actually start thinking pretty highly of ourselves. But when you spend time in the presence of God, you quickly realize that it is all about Him. Everything's about Him. Right? And I will tell you, if your life is a mess right now, right? If you have no peace right now, if there's areas of your life where you have no idea what to do, you know, or if you're actually starting to feel pretty good about yourself right now and the fact that you are so much better than the people around you. Like you might be more committed, you do more things than the people around you and you're actually feeling really good about that, then I'm going to tell you, you do not spend enough time in the presence of God. Because somehow this became about you and was never meant to be about you. And I'll be honest, especially these days, I would say in the last maybe three to five years, um, I'm a little bit more terrified than usual because one of the things that I'm realizing is there is a complete disinterest in people reading their Bibles. Like I remember before, like you would talk to people and they'd be like, I, I, you know, I'm wrestling with something. I've got to go get in the word of God and I've got to go kind of figure it out and I'm going to pray for God to, you know, to, to, to guide me, to lead me, to speak to me. You know, I remember I was talking to people and they're wrestling with something in their life. And they were saying, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to fast. And I'm going to fast until he gives me an answer, right? Just pursuing God, going hard after him, right? And I feel like, may God forgive me, but those days are gone, right? We don't hear about that at all. Now when we need spiritual guidance, it comes from our friends, right? We go, we get the opinions of other people, right? We go to Instagram, we go to Twitter, we go to, all, we go to social media, we go to all of these places, but are we really pursuing God anymore? With these, with these obstacles in our life and the challenges in our life. So what we're going to be reading from today is going to be from 2 Peter 1, uh, the first chapter. The first thing I'm going to read is just 12 through 15. It says, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth, yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir, up, uh, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that I must put off my tent just as, as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. I'm going to reread that part. Knowing that I shortly must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure you always to have a reminder of these things after my decease. And when I read this, you know, that part stood out to me. Knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. So St. Saint, Saint Peter at this point, he knows he's approaching the end of his life. Okay, and how did he know that? Well, the Bible doesn't exactly tell us that point, but my guess is it was probably some type of personal revelation between him and God, right? But I will tell you, we do know what it says in John 21, 18 and 19. It says, most assuredly, I say to you that when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will gird you 
and carry you, carry you where you do not wish. And he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken to this, he said to him, follow me. That's not the most popular sales tactic ever to get somebody to follow you, right? But he's basically saying, when you were young, you got to do what you wanted to do. But when you're older, someone's going to bind you, right? They're going to take you where you don't want to go. Um, it's going to be hard, but follow me. Think about that. That's tough. And I'm going to tell you that that is an exact, that's an exact picture of our spiritual life, right? In our spiritual life, when we're immature, we do what we want without even thinking about it. We give very, very little weight, right? Because who's it about? It's about us. But when we grow older and more spiritually mature, we are led by the Holy Spirit to do difficult things. Things we don't want to do, but we do them anyways. And I'm going to tell you, if you are not at that point in your spiritual life yet, then you're behind. We should all be there. And I believe that a lot of us are not there yet because we are not spending time alone in the presence of God. Because that's where he hands out the assignments. That's where he tells us. I believe that's why St. Peter here knew that his time was coming. Right? And I love this passage because Christ didn't sugarcoat it one bit. He told him, you know what? You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die a tough death. It's going to be hard. Follow me. Follow me. And you start thinking, in what right mind did St. Peter say okay? And it was because he found something that was even more valuable than his own life. And I wonder, are we there yet? Like, are we there yet? And if you think following Christ is easy, it's never going to be easy. If you think it's a road of prosperity, no, it's not a road of prosperity. You think it's a road of self-glory? Nope, we didn't find that either. None of that, but I will tell you, is what he's basically telling St. Peter is, yeah, it's going to be all of the things that I promised you. It's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. It's going to end in death. It's going to this and this and this and this and this. But he said, I'm worth it. Christ is the same thing Christ tells every single one of us here. He says, but I'm worth it. Like, I will give you a life far better than the one that you think is good. Right? Kind of like he said to, to Abraham. He says, you know, are you going to trust me with your tomorrows? And St. Peter said, yes. The ending is worth it. You have to hold on to the ending. We will never be disappointed. I've never met one person who made the decision to go all in and came back later and regretted it. So we have to go all in and we have to know it's going to be worth it. So again, St. Peter knows it's going to be soon. And I am so impressed with St. Peter that in his last time, right, where he knows that the window is going to be uh, closing, right, how does he want to spend that time? While he's alive, he says, I want to make sure that when I go, they're going to be okay. That they're going to be self-sufficient. That they're going to be able to keep going. Right? <clears throat> and, and I kind of wonder, right? So if this meeting here, whether it be me, Abuna, Mark Gerges, you know, let's just say that this Sunday meeting went away. Okay? We stopped doing it. Something else happened. We, we went in a different direction. Where are you going to get your intake from? Where are you going to get the word of God from? Are you going to be okay? And by the grace of God, we have this meeting, right? But I encourage you guys, like, you know, I, and, and there's some of you guys who say, hey, Pete, this is the icing on the cake for me. I'm okay. This meeting went away. That's cool. I, well, I'm going to be good. I still, I read. I'm in my word. I take my quiet time. I get my direction. Uh, but my, I fear others, maybe not so much. See, because some people will listen to the Bible sometimes, right? And then it all ends up, you know, usually it'll, it'll sound like the person that usually said, oh, yeah, 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 so there's a Bible study. Okay, so, so who's, who's, who's speaking? Or what, what, are they, what are they covering, right? Because for them, they're still trying to decide if they're going to attend, right? Okay, so that person's speaking, that's the topic. How long is it going to be? Because I don't want it to be too long. If it's too long, you know, I get kind of, you know, or what, what day of the week is it? Right? We have all these, like, if it's, if it's convenient, right? Like, if it, if it works for my schedule, then we'll, we'll schedule them in there sometimes, right? And I will tell you, we need people who just love the Word of God. They love it when they're in it themselves. They love it when other people are speaking it. They love it just being around it. They can love 
in, in the background while they're driving. You know, we need people who just love the Word of God. People who sit with it, read it, study it, memorize it, pray about it. Like, that is what God is looking for, right? And what St. Peter is saying here is, I want you guys to be okay on your own. Like, I'm going to be departing. Imagine what that meant to the early church, right? St. Peter was the guy who, who spoke at Pentecost, who converted 3,000 people. His departure was going to be big. And he says, I need to make sure you're going to be okay if I'm not here. Right? In verse 16, it says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to the power of um, our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Eyewitnesses to his majesty. And I'm going to tell you, like, it's like St. Saint, Saint Peter's telling you, like, guys, this is all real. Like, Christ is coming back. This is not a hoax, right? This is not just a clever story. And he says something that's huge. He says, I was an eyewitness to his majesty. Like, I know what I saw. I know what I experienced, right? And that's a special verse, especially for us at the Church of the Holy Transfiguration, because that is exactly what he's referring to. Okay? Exactly. Verse 17 says, For he received from the Father glory and honor when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son of whom I'm well pleased. So this verse is basically saying, I know what I saw on that mountain. Like I experienced it firsthand. Okay, I saw the transfiguration in Matthew 17. See, because Christ took St. Peter, St. James, St. John up the mountain. It was just the four of them. And they said that they saw his glory. They heard his voice. They were all, you know, they all started talking. Christ's face shined like the sun. It's crazy. It says that, you know, as if that wasn't enough, you had Elijah show up, Moses show up, the cloud appears, very symbolic of the Old Testament, and they hear the voice, this is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And they were all terrified and they all fell on their face. And St. Paul, I mean, I'm sorry, St. Peter is saying that I was there. Like, I was terrified. Right? I know, that I, I know what I saw. I know what I experienced. I was an eyewitness. Right? And in verse 19, it says something else that's huge. It says, and, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the dawn and the morning star rises in your heart. And I'm going to tell you, that was prophetic word for him at that time. So much more meaning for us today. Because our prophetic word, Christ, who came, answered all the prophecies. Okay, but he left us with prophetic word too, which we, found, we find here in our Bible. You go back to the first century, they didn't have this. And here we are, teed up prophetic words, 66 books bound for us that we can read through them whenever we want. He says, I know it's true. I've seen it, right? I have something more sure than just the experience that I had. Like the experience was great, but like when we have prophetic word, that's confirmed, like, that's, that's big. Like, we can't get away from that. We have something so much better. The Bible. Everything in this book is true. Word for word. Every single book has never been proven wrong. Science has been trying to prove our Bible wrong for decades, centuries. It's <coughs> never found a fault. It's true as true can be. Right? Right? And I'm going to tell you, there is nothing more sure in your life than this Bible. So we should pay more attention to it. Like a lamp in a dark place, it's the only light that we need on this dark earth. And I think about this, right? Because this word is a light. And when we do not have this light with us, it's like walking around in a dark room. Have you ever walked around in a dark room and bumped into something? It hurts. It hurts a lot sometimes. And that's what I think about when, when I'm walking around a dark place with no light. But for me, I'm walking around in a dark place with no light, making bad decisions, decisions that don't line up to what God's word says. And that's how we're always bumping into things. It's how we get hurt. It's how we hurt other people. And what St. Peter's telling us is like, you, you need the light. You need the light. And St. Peter also warns us about, against cunning fables and that we should not be deceived by it. And ironically, I think he gives us too much credit. We are stumbling on way simpler things than cunning fables. 
Because where do we get, where do we get our guidance now? You know, it's hilarious. You turn on the TV, right? And what's everybody talking about, right? We're getting our guidance now from athletes, actors, you know, the most ridiculous things. And those are the people we're, we're supposed to be following. Famous people, our friends. Like th this is where we go now for advice as if we didn't have the word of God. Like I get it, maybe in the first century when the Bible wasn't here yet, like I get it, right? But now we have the word, the prophetic word confirmed, bound for us, and we don't turn to that. You know, and I'll tell you something. I've been doing this for a while, and there's a lot of times where I have, you know, friends, coworkers, whatever, and they come to me and, with problems, right? Like really bad situations. And they're like, Pete, I, I, got, I need your advice. Like this is kind of where I'm at. This is what happened. Here's the situation I'm in, right? And I will tell you, ultimately, most of the times, I would say to a good 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the time, do you know why they're in that situation? Because they follow someone else's bad advice. Because someone else told them something that they kind of wanted to hear, right? And they follow that advice. It's hilarious. I have friends where they'll come ask me something. I'll give them what I think, biblically rooted. They don't like that. They go to somebody else. They don't like that. They go to somebody else. They don't like... So by the sixth person, they tell them something that they want to hear. And then they're like, that is great advice. I'm going to take that. And it's so bad, so destructive, right? It's weird how we'll buy into almost anything if it lines up with what we want to believe, and then we'll follow it. But this book has been around for thousands of years. Prophecies have come to fulfillment thousands of years later, and it has guided the lives of millions of people before us. And we neglect it. See, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, if you pull up aside anybody that you know, that you spiritually respect, Someone, and I know we all have these people in our lives where we say, this person, they've got a deep relationship with God, right? If you pull them to the side, I dare you to ask them, tell me about the influence the Bible has on your daily life. Just ask them, how much time do you spend in the Word? Do you read the Bible for yourself? Tell me about your relationship with your Bible, right? And I'm curious, but I'm pretty sure they're going to tell you that that Bible has a very big influence on their life and they're very actively engaged in it, right? But we throw all of whatever the Bible says out because we'd rather hear what our friends are telling us. We'd rather hear the things that we kind of wanted to hear, right? Whether it be from our friends, you know, famous people, the majority, what you see on the news, what you, know, what you see in society, all of that stuff is where we usually go to. But St. Peter keeps it simple. He says, I don't care what anybody tells me. I know what I saw on the mountain. What I saw on the mountain was Christ is Lord, period, right? And if Christ is Lord, all of his teachings are true, and that's, that's all I need. I experienced it. I heard the voice. I'm good. And I'm going to tell you, in the world of fads, you know, in the world that we live in right now where everything's coming and going, the Bible will always be true. It will never change. And I promise you, I'm 43 years old. The Bible has never disappointed me. It's never disappointed me. Verse 20, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy never comes from the will of man but from holy men of God as they were spoke as were moved by the Holy Spirit. I just want you guys to wrap your mind around this real quick. So basically it's saying that you know this book was written by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wrote this book from cover to cover every single word in it. It used a number of different authors but it, those were authors that the Holy Spirit used. It is the author of this book. So I'm going to ask you guys something. When we are sitting down to read our Bibles, are we inviting the Holy Spirit into that? Because the same person who wrote the book is the same one that could very much be sitting with us while we're reading that book. How often do you take advantage, uh, advantage of that? Before you get in your Bible, do you pray for that? Will you just pray, God, just open my eyes to your word. I'm coming here to meet you. I don't want to just read words on a page, right? I want you to give me my message. I want the Holy Spirit inside of me to be guiding me through this. If that means that you're going to highlight words, you're going to highlight words. If that means that there's going to be a message here you want me to take away, that's fine. I'm all for it, even if I don't like it. If you're going to tell me something that I don't want to hear, that's fine. Even if it's going to hurt, just please tell me the truth. Even if it makes my heart my, even if it makes my life harder, correct me, point it out to me, because that Holy Spirit who wrote that Bible 
is with us while we are reading it. And I promise you, there's a lot of things that I wished were true in here, but they aren't in here. And there's a lot of things that I wish weren't true, but the Bible says that they are true. But if we seek for truth every single time, he will give it to us. So I came across this verse, and it just convicted me. Isaiah 66, 2 said, For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one will I look. So he's basically saying, this is the one I will look at. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. One who is a poor and contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Man. And I sat there and I thought about that. And I said, you know, is that, is that what I'm known for? Like, is that what I'm known for? Right? Is that what you're known for? Like, do you think that that's what God can see when he looks at us? Where, where he looks at us and he says, you know, Peter's really humble. You know, or you're really humble. It, it, are we the type of humble that God is looking for? Right? It's tough. Because I will tell you, even if we act humble, we cannot act humble in front of God. If we have pride, God knows about it. And not only that, God says, I will resist the proud. That's a very hard thing to hide before God, right? So how are we doing there? We have to learn. We have to learn how to be humble the way that he wants us to be humble. And you will never be humble without spending time in the presence of God because it is his goodness and his greatness and his almightiness that makes us realize that we are nothing. And what really got me, because there's one thing that, look, we all have pride and we're going to work through that, right? We're going to be working through that to our very last day. But the second part is what really got me. And he who trembles at my word. Because that is 100% in our control. It's easier. It's a daily decision, right? Do we tremble at his word? And it's funny because if we look at it, right, say, well, you know what? If I was on the mountain during the transfiguration, right, and I saw Elijah and Moses pop up and I would, the cloud and the voice coming down, I'm sure we would have all trembled, right? We we, would have, we might have even done more than tremble, right? But even though we weren't there, what type of respect do we hold for his word, right? Like, what type of respect do you hold for the Bible? Because we should tremble, and this is an issue. It's a huge issue. A lot of us come and a lot of us listen, right? And a lot of the times, I look, another confession of a speaker, and may God forgive me, but, and I'm, not, of course, not this group, but um, a lot of the times I feel like it is my job to convince people to do whatever I'm talking about, right? It's almost like it's a sales job a little bit where I've got to like almost, you know, convince you guys like, hey, this is a good thing. I want you guys to do it, blah, 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 blah. And I got to give 10 points on why it makes sense for you to do it and why your life will be better, right? And I'll be honest with you, when I read something like this, you know, I think... Shouldn't the fact that it's the Word of God, the Word of God, which is timed and true for centuries, shouldn't that just be enough? And then one of the things that I know I've probably set up here at least a dozen times, but the thing that always sits with me the heaviest, and I want you guys to pay attention to this, right? A great talk will never change your life, period. A great talk will never change your life. There is only one thing that will ever change you. And it's sitting, time, it's sitting alone in the presence of God, period. Someone told me that when I was 19 years old. And it changed the rest of my life. And I remember it was a priest, and I told the priest, and I said, no, but Abuna, you've given, like, you've given me life-changing talks. And he says, no. He's a, a good speaker, can encourage you. He can motivate you. He can do all of that stuff, right? But if he can encourage you and motivate you to spend time alone in the presence of God, then it wasn't the speaker that did anything, right? It's always, every single time, the time alone in the presence of God. That's the only thing that will change you. So I'm going to ask you, are there aspects of your life that you want change, right? Are there aspects of your life that you think that Christ himself has been trying to get you to change, right? 
because those are the times where he's trying to draw you into time alone in his presence to work that stuff through. So that's my prayer. It's my prayer for this week, next week. I'll be honest with you. I might even extend it out. I'm going to ask you how it went when I get back from Kenya. Okay? But my prayer is that all of us see the value of spending time alone in the presence of God because it is the only thing that will deepen our relationships with Christ. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up for prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you because you are a great God, Lord. And sometimes it just blows my mind how you search for us and we are the ones who turn from you. For Lord, when we talk about time alone that the presence of God, I know that your heart skips a beat because it's the thing that you yearn for, Lord. It's your desire, Lord. And it just, I can't even wrap my mind around the fact that even when we choose things over you, you never choose things over us, but you're always waiting and willing to, to, you know, to receive us every time we come to look for you, Lord. Every single time we come to have your presence, Lord. So Lord, I ask that you just, that you make those times more abundant, Lord. I ask that you convict hearts today, Lord, that it will create something inside of us, Lord, where we want to desire time with you, where we want to be in your presence, Lord. For Lord, you are sweeter than honey. Lord, and anyone who tastes you, Lord, we cannot turn from you. For Lord, there is nothing better than you. But Lord, we know that sometimes it takes a leap of faith, Lord, to let go of the things that we're currently holding on to, to pursue you and your goodness. So Lord, if we need a little help on that leap, Lord, I ask that you speak tender words to every single one of us here. For Lord, we know that it is your kindness that brings us to repentance. And so, Lord, I ask that when we, when in, in the coming days, Lord, when we're stepping into your presence, Lord, I ask that you just let your presence just reign over us, Lord, in a way that we can't deny it. The same way that when St. Peter said, I know what I experienced. Lord, I ask that each one of us here has that same experience with you in your presence, Lord. Because we know that that's where growth will happen. That's where intimacy happens, Lord. That's where correction happens. That's where you will pour out blessings on us, Lord, but also pour out correction so that we may grow and prune us. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord. I ask that you protect us from the fiery darts of Satan, Lord, because we know he attacks whenever something good is about to happen. So, Lord, I ask that you protect us from that, Lord, and that you pave the way for a deep relationship with you. And I ask in the sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, Thetoko St. Mary, your beloved Son, all the saints from our chairs, here as we pray one voice saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.